I'm going to pick up a couple of threads, and in a way, I think I'm going to ask one question about panel and ask for you know a, a, sh a short response from everybody. And then people have been listening for a long time, so then we'll open it to people to ask, and I'll take maybe three or four points questions. Uh, but I'm going to ask I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask a, one question of everybody. <coughs> you, you said that you feel liberty and pluralism are really not threatened. And yet, there would be those who would contest that and say that they are threatened. Um, I, I sense that what's bad for us as liberal Jews is going to be bad for you as liberal Muslims. It may depend which part of the world we are in, who's in the front line and who's in the second line. But the question would be, how do we engage for the sake of liberty and pluralism? I become anxious over the last many years, that actually it's post-enlightenment secularism that has created a civic space in which we can interact with freedom of speech, <coughs> equality of gender and person, and democracy, and that, and that aspects of religion that do not support these as their values. And, and how, are we, how are we gonna defend our freedoms? You, earlier on, Shukla, that, that excellent phrase, poverty of engagement. And you talk about poverty of empathy, in a way. And you talked about unawareness of poverty. How do we, how do we work to protect that space without going back to a kind of Esperanto philosophy where in order to have a space, you dare not be different? Because I think we want equality with difference and not equality without difference, otherwise it isn't freedom. That would be my question, and to ask uh, Chikili for just a, a very short comment for people, and then I'm going to open it to at least one round of, uh, of, of questions from, for, for, from, from people. Um, does anybody want to sort of try that one? It's, it's, a, it's really two or three suggestive, suggesting sentences from each of you. Does anyone want to try that one first? Go on. So just to clarify, what I think is, is there's not going to be a government coming in anytime soon that's going to abolish liberty or do anything other than support pluralism. <coughs> That's not the threat. What the threat is, is, is to human life, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah it's to human... That's the threat that people feel is, is not to abstract principles, it's to, it's to human life. And the only way I think that we can even begin to start dealing with that anxiety is to establish <coughs> relationships across. And, and not only with other liberals, Let's see how it goes with, with some other kinds of people too. You know, that's that's the key. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Thank you. And um, just a short point that I'm just reflecting on the way in which communities have behaved, and we're focusing right now on the British context and looking at that Muslim communities. Um, it's it's not a real surprise that when we look at the way in which people behaved and reacted towards something like the Rushdie affair in the late 1980s, 1989, I think. Um, I'm far too young to remember, of course. No, I'm not. Um, but um, I, I do, I have seen lots of images, and I do remember some images on TV screens at the time of people burning things in public and going out and, and causing havoc in bookshops and and public spaces, essentially. And, and in a sense, we were, at that time, we were looking at the first generation of British Muslim communities who really didn't know how to react or how to behave. So what I, how I understand that is that they took um, a model, if you can call it a model, that was from a foreign land, from a land that they may have been familiar with, perhaps in the subcontinent or, or elsewhere, and they appropriated those sort of mechanisms of, uh, I guess, manifesting their frustration, their anger, their hurt, and their offence, essentially. Whatever we may think of that reaction. But the way in which we saw British people and British Muslims react a couple of weeks ago when the Charlie Hebdo cartoons were published, when the front page was published, was actually quite different. There was hurt, there was confusion, 
there was a sense of offence, of course, all of the same things that, that we, we imagine the communities must have felt during the Rushdie affair. But the response was quite different. The response is conversation, like we're having today. And I'm not sure whether these kinds of opportunities were available to communities at that time. I'm not sure whether Jewish or Muslim communities were ready to have these kinds of conversations. We've heard some difficult things today, but some important things that ought to be, ought to be shared publicly. Um, so one is, for me, there's been a movement from how that generation and how the current generation of Muslims, mainly third generation uh, and some second generation, but how they've responded, how they've reacted, um, trying to sort of process and try to understand um, what freedom means, what causing offence can mean, and, and sometimes what it means to stand in another person's shoes. Also, the other thing I wanted to mention is I think one of, one of the areas that we really have an advantage, should we wish to seize it, is that the partnerships and the alliances and the friendships, most importantly, that we build here in Britain, uh, in London, or the wider country, Im can impact on issues and situations in the rest <coughs> of the world. Not just in one particular part of the world, but the rest of the world. And I think we have a liberty here where we can engage, we can discuss, we can talk about difficult subjects in a way that can help draw us closer together through understanding and that can impact on other people's relationships, other communities and their relations in different parts of the world. And I think that's a real asset that we have, a real opportunity. And I'd like to see seize, seize that much more so than we, we're doing currently. Thank you. To me, that touches on the point that John made earlier about the capacity to ritualise tensions and verbalise tensions. And I uh, appreciate that. Still well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, if I, if I can start to answer that question by focusing on something that I may disagree with slightly with my, with my good friend, Morrison, or at least point out a different angle of... Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for the permission. Um, I think what, when it comes, you see, when we've got a real challenge when it comes to dealing with the anxieties that Muslims feel in this, in this whole thing, because I've been hearing for, not, not now, but for five or six years, Muslims saying they can't live in this country, they want to go to Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever it is. Some have now actually started buying second homes in those places, simply to keep their options open, because they don't know that if things turn worse or sour, uh, more difficult with counter-terrorism policies and so on and so forth, <coughs> so these are things that you know, Muslim communities feel tremendously aggrieved by. Now, I'm not, I'm not defending that sense of aggrievement or, 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 or victimhood. And I've, I've repeatedly said that we, as Muslims, need to, need to, we, we need to wade through that, we need to go past it. Because I think when you feel pain, the idea, and I think where religion helps, is that it should help us to process anger, pain, insult, injury, and help us to move beyond that and not be defined by it. We face it, we feel it, we confront it, but we're not defined. We don't define ourselves as victims. But the challenge when dealing with Muslim communities is that you're talking about anxiety without the same level of social capital that you very rightly pointed out. So Muslims are still taxi drivers. Um, and that's, that's the big difference. You know, you're, you're talking about people who feel the anxiety, but also feel at the same time the other side of, of the pain that they feel is that they haven't yet made it. And, and so their sense of control over their own destinies, their sense of power and agency is very different. Um, and I think that, in a way, exacerbates um, the problem. Now, I think, for me, and in terms of what I'm trying to do with New Horizons, and Rabbi Jonathan alluded to this earlier, is we have to really develop a deep appreciation of the opportunities that we have around us. You know, thinking about our context, thinking about what Europe offers to us, our, not only our recent history, but our present. What do human rights mean to us? What does the freedom that we have in this country and in this continent really mean to us? How do we, how do we develop a theology that can really value that? 
when the world comes together after two devastating wars and decides to think of what, it, what does it mean to be human? What rights do we have as human beings? You know, we're thinking now of eight, the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta this year. What does that sense of being, standing for the rule of law, standing for the rights of the small guy over the big guy, you know, what does all of that mean? Absolutely. We have to develop a theology that takes all of that into account. Because unless our theology grapples with those issues, it's always going to be a foreign theology. It's not going to be an embedded, rooted British or European or Western theology at the start. And I think, again, what we can learn from the Jewish community, what we can learn from the Christian experience, don't forget, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all began, started off their journeys in very close proximity. And they've migrated out, they've moved out, and they've gone to different places. I think we have a tremendous amount that we can learn from the journey of Judaism, from the journey of Christianity, in thinking about our role and place in the earth. John? So, um, one of the things that occurs to me that's different about, about the Jewish community and the Muslim community is uh, sort of the, the, the origins of our, of our story here in Britain. Um, when Jew, Jews came, most Jews uh, can tra trace their, their, um, their, their roots back to um, to Eastern Europe or to Germany. The vast majority of this community came at some point between 1881 and 1939. Um, and Jews, when they came, there were, there were sort of two dynamics going on at that time. One was, you know, Jews were, on, on the one hand, largely, in many respects, hoping for a better life, for, you know, for, for better prospects, but they were also, in many, in many, on many occasions, fleeing from anti-Semitism. But when they came to Britain, they, um, they desperately wanted to become British. Um, and Britain um, was a, you know, was a huge empire that had a very strong sense of self. Um, and very much sort of wanted to, not necessarily in the nicest possible ways always, to anglicise these, these sort of Eastern European immigrants to become part of British society. So we, there was a dynamic where Jews were kind of desperate to integrate into British society, and Britain had a very strong sense of what it was and wanted to, you know, and was ready to kind of impose that if necessary on Jews. Um, that's changed today. Um, it seems to me that, you know, certainly, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of the, uh, probably the main, the main part, I don't know for certain, but there's, there's a significant part of the, of the Muslim community that I think is here, that came here partly for, 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 partly because, for very similar reasons actually, you know, for a better life and in certain ways <coughs> because they were, they were fleeing oppression and discrimination. Um, uh, so there's, 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 that in, there's that in common, but it seems to me there is a part of the Muslim community that has a real, that has an issue with Western values, doesn't like them, um, and, 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 uh, you know, and, and, and struggles with them, and struggles against them. I don't have no real sense of how, how, what proportion of the Muslim community feels that way, but it's there, and certainly perhaps because of social media, its voice feels very loud. Um, at the same time, Britain today, I think, you know, is a, you know, was a was a huge empire has gone into decline. It's like a, there's a very strong narrative that's very critical of its colonial past, um, and I think Britain has a, has a much weaker sense of what it is today. Um, and I, I, I think um, you know, I think on the one hand, there's this, and I agree agree with Dilwa, there's there's something to be done sort of within the Muslim community about sort of develop. Um, I like what you said about developing a theology that that really struggles with and, and incorporates and engages with, with Western ideas. But I also think the other side of that coin is, is something about Britain. Um, and, 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 and really sort of coming, I think Britain coming to, coming to grips with, what, what are we? Who are we? What exactly is it we're asking people to integrate into? Because if that's not clear, if that's not robust, then why, why should people want to integrate into it? One of the things that really strikes me about the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo and the, and the, and the kosher supermarket events in, in France was just, just how, um, how powerful and how strongly people felt um, democracy, the importance of democracy, the importance of freedom. Like people, it, kind of, it took an event like that for people to say, this stuff, these freedoms are absolutely core to who we are. <coughs> There's a question here, I think, to Britain. Like what, what's really core to who we are? 
Are there all sorts of differences, etc. But what's really core, and how do we best communicate that and assert that, um, and be clear about it, um, in order to you know, in order to, to make this place a compelling place to to a place that we can feel proud of. Who, Brits who have lived here and lived here for a number of times, for, for, for many, many years, but also a compelling place to integrate into and to want to be part of. And the guest says, you know, we don't want you kid to answer that question. <laughs> Is it, I'm, I'm in a dilemma as to, to what to do. It seems to me that actually what we need to do as a community is to keep the conversation going. Because we're not narrowing down the questions, how could we? We're deepening and broadening. And I'm also very conscious that whereas, as I said over the phone to Rabbi Kujia, we're an interfaith audience, it's only really partially true, but actually it would be good to engage where there's more quality of numbers and where we can hear more voices and actually we're putting difficult things on the table and that, that's not, I think they're difficult in, in related ways for you as well, but, but it's, not, it's also quite harsh.